In terms of deciding what to use for patients, whether it should be cetuximab or cytotoxic chemotherapy, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a biomarker to, to go on in squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, as opposed to, for instance, colorectal cancer, where clearly if there's a KRAS mutation, one should not administer cetuximab to that patient because there'll be no benefit. RAS mutations do occur in patients with head and neck cancer, but very infrequently. And KRAS mutations, almost, almost never. It's usually HRAS mutations. So for head and neck cancer, unfortunately, we don't have a biomarker yet. We have some hints at biomarkers, but, but nothing uh, definitive. So what we do is we depend on clinical parameters to decide. In the local advanced setting, it's usually patients who are not good candidates for platinum, patients who have borderline renal failure, patients who may have uh, borderline hearing function, or some of the other toxicities that we worry about when we administer cisplatin. And those are patients that we would often treat uh, with cetuximab. Uh, on, in the recurrent metastatic setting, cetuximab really becomes either part of the first-line chemotherapy because of the extreme trial, or um, uh, often a preferred uh, second-line agent uh, uh, because it really does tend to be very well tolerated as a single agent with quite manageable toxicities. But in terms of um, deciding which patients uh, to use it on, it really comes down to clinical parameters for the most part. In terms of HPV status and response to cetuximab, I, I would say that this is still a controversial issue. Uh, and uh, there's evidence on both sides uh, suggesting that it doesn't matter, and there's evidence suggesting that it does matter. Well, let's look at the data uh, uh, as best we can. In, in the locally advanced setting, the best data set we have is from the uh, so-called Bonner study, or the study that added cetuximab to radiation therapy. And in an analysis that was re recently done uh, looking at HPV status, it looked like HPV positive and HPV negative patients had the same degree of benefit with the addition of cetuximab. HPV positive patients did better, no surprise there, we know they're a better prognostic group, but when you look at the degree of benefit, the separation in the curves, if you will, that separation appeared to be the same. So in the locally advanced setting with about eight weeks of cetuximab delivered with radiation, it doesn't seem to make a difference with the best data set that we have. In the recurrent and metastatic setting, that's where it begins to get uh, a little bit uh, trickier. There are some studies that have suggested that for HPV-positive patients, cetuximab does not work so well. And if we look at the biology of HPV-positive disease, we begin to see that for the most part, it's not an EGFR-driven tumor. We don't see EGFR gene copy increases or EGFR amplification. We see other types of alterations that appear to be tumor drivers that are not affected by inhibition of EGFR, that are not affected by cetuximab. And that's led um, some people to think that uh, H in the HPV-positive patients, cetuximab may be less effective. The problem is that we don't really have great data. We don't have prospective data that has taken patients with HPV-positive cancers and randomized them to cetuximab versus something else. Um, the, the best data set that we do have uh, employs a drug called afatinib, which is a small molecule inhibitor of EGFR and its family of receptors, not a monoclonal antibody. And for afatinib, it does appear that HPV-positive patients do not benefit as much than, uh, as their HPV-negative counterparts. But if we could extend that to a uh, drug like cetuximab, we're not sure. The differences in quality of life and toxicities are between cetuximab and cytotoxic chemotherapy are, are really uh, quite apparent. Uh, we know that cetuximab has associated toxicities, of course. Uh, most typically, that's a rash, um, and the so-called acneiform rash. Um, it can uh, have uh, hypomagnesemia and other changes to the uh, integumentary uh, system. But for the most part, these toxicities are manageable. Uh, now that we've recognized them, we've learned to deal with them, we've learned to, in fact, in some cases, prevent them from getting worse, I would say it's unusual in, in our practice to have a patient actually come off cetuximab purely for toxicity. It still happens once in a while, but it's, but it's quite unusual. So for the most part, cetuximab is actually a, a pretty well-tolerated agent.
Um, now, the same is true for cytotoxic chemotherapy, but those side effects can be sometimes a little bit harder to manage. Uh, cisplatin has associated uh, nephropathy, for instance, that can be hard to manage. Uh, electrolyte abnormalities, especially in the locally advanced setting, can be difficult uh, because these patients often don't um, drink, very, drink very well because of the mucositis, they don't eat very well because of the mucositis, and, uh, and those toxicities can get patients into trouble and, in fact, even can lead to hospitalization or, or uh, more serious than that. Cytotoxic chemotherapy uh, can be myelosuppressive, so neutropenia, um, uh, thrombocytopenia, anemia, uh, of course, we've known about for decades, but uh, still pose a problem in patients we're treating with, uh, for either locally advanced or, or recurrent metastatic disease. So um, I would say, in general, cetuximab tends to be better tolerated than cytotoxic chemotherapy, and the toxicities are uh, manageable. There is one toxicity, though, that we do need to be aware of uh, it, with cetuximab in the locally advanced setting, and that's radiation dermatitis. A uh, few studies um, more recently have uh, demonstrated pretty consistently that the addition of cetuximab to radiation does increase radiation dermatitis. Again, this is something that's manageable. It's preventable, uh, but we have to know about it in order to do that. And awareness is the most important thing. We don't have an absolute standard of care of defined surveillance regimens. The most important point to be made is that it is important to do surveillance after treatment. In terms of immediately after treatment, I think the first most important lesson is not to do a PET too soon if you're going to do a PET. In our practice, the very earliest we'll obtain them is two months out. Otherwise, you get a lot of false positives that can lead to unnecessary salvage uh, surgeries with a lot of morbidity from doing that. And then in my practice, we uh, surveil patients every three months for at least the first two years. And the modalities by which you do this are nasopharyngolaryngoscopy for patients with mucosal tumors that you can see, uh, as well as imaging. The other point I'd like to make is that for the smoking-driven head and neck cancer patient, there can be value in surveillance imaging of the lungs as well. And here you're not so much looking for metastatic spread from your original tumor as a new stage one lung cancer. The NLST finally gave us um, data on uh, surveillance of patients with heavy smoking histories. Most of these patients meet the NLST criteria anyway. And even for those who don't, we know that there's such a high rate of new stage one lung cancer um, that I do get annual low dose CAT scans. After we uh, treat a patient with head and neck cancer, uh, based on the high or low risk stratification, then the level of concern for surveillance comes into play. Uh, the, when we say somebody has a, uh, a long-term survival of 50 percent, well, our hope is to identify recurrence early enough that we can intervene and hopefully uh, apply a second uh, uh, swing at the ball, a second effort to cure, or implement uh, a palliative therapy, a salvage therapy, soon enough uh, that we may have a chance of really prolonging life. So surveillance is important. Uh, traditionally, we've used CAT scans of the neck or chest. Um, PET CT scans have been used uh, for the past 10 or 15 years, uh, in part because they give functional imaging in addition to anatomic imaging. Oftentimes, lymph nodes in the neck shrink back down to a centimeter, but they don't go away. And so having the ability to, to see uh, FDG avidity, PET avidity, helps us to say that a lymph node doesn't disappear but it's not avid on a PET scan, and so it's likely benign. Whereas when you just had CAT scans, that lymph node may have shrunken down, but not disappeared, and we didn't really know, and often had to remove lymph nodes in the neck three months after treatment to ask whether we had a complete response. A study was presented at ASCO last year using the PET scan in the surveillance setting in a randomized fashion, showing that you really could avoid those unnecessary surgical procedures on the neck, and the PET scan was an accurate way to perform post-treatment surveillance. The first question to ask in seeing the case of a recurrence is whether it's locally only recurrent and whether there might still be a curative option. So we have an old historic literature showing us that for recurrent or persistent disease after chemoradiotherapy, that surgical salvage can result in a cure. Surgery is not possible. The next question is whether re-irradiation might be possible for the local only recurrent. 
And this is really a conversation to have with the radiation oncologist. But if the fields are different or if a lot of time has passed, then it generally um, often can be and can result in a cure. Now for the patient who truly has no local option or who has metastatic disease, then at that point you're talking about systemic palliative chemotherapy.